Yes. Yeah. I am, I am like, you know, the Tokyo, we call people that are like old Tokyo, uh, Edo-ko, right? Edo-ko. But I'm like Toronto-ko. Toronto-ko. Right? Be- because uh, my family moved to Toronto when there were 40,000 people there. John, I truly want to thank you for being here today. I mean, I've known you for over 20, 20, 20, 20, 20 years, years at, least, at least. At least. And I missed out on the chance. Wait, I should tell all of you. I missed out on the chance of having John as my speechwriter <laughs> when I was actually the head of the American Chamber of Commerce. He came to me, and I just thought, that's, come on, to write my speech. And I thought, how many speeches would I be doing? He ended up, he ended up at the same time, ended up being the speechwriter for Carlos, Carlos Goen, the first foreigner CEO of Nissan Motors. And as you might know, I mean, because of all the things that happened over the news, he basically escaped from Japan, and he's now living where? Beirut, Lebanon. In Beirut, Lebanon. Yes, three okay. years. I was just, but that's but, but, but that's but let me, CCJ, I no, you were TAC. When you, no, we, it's both. I'm the you, first you American both. to do both. Okay, well, I was the speechwriter for two ACCJ presidents, and that's where I, I really cut my eye teeth on speechwriting. You mean ACCJ or two AC, TAC presidents? No, two ACCJ Day presidents. President, I know that, chance. Ed, Ed Riley, uh, who back in 1991, 1991, 92, something like that, he... 1991, I think, and he was president for two years, right. and then Rick Johansson succeeded him. So three years, and Straight the, 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 the best part of doing that was introductions for the luncheons, and the, which are really important. And and once uh, I did an introduction for Bill Gates, and like 15 years later, somebody at the Foreign Correspondents Club said to me. Oh, well, you, you wrote that one. I thought wait, that wait, was wait, the wait. best introduction. <laughs> well, Bill, when Bill Gates came here, you're the one that gave, made his speech, his, his opening the, 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 the ACCJ president's introduction of Bill Gates. Oh, Bill Gates. Okay, I thought you because right. when Bill Gates came here, I met him oh, at yeah. that time. Yeah. But it was, he also came to the American Club. Oh, really? Yeah. And I was up there. Yeah. Now, John, let's start off with okay. where you were born. Toronto, Canada. So you're Canadian, eh? Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. I'm, I'm like, you know, Tokyo, we call people that are like old Tokyo, uh, Edo-ko, right? Edo-ko, but I'm right. like Toronto-ko, Toronto-ko. Right? Be- because uh, my family moved to Toronto when there were 40,000 people there, and uh, there are now 7 what you, million. What years would that be? What year would that 1840-something. 1840-something. From where? Um, uh, Scotland and France. Scotland and France. Yeah. So, we, so you weren't in the speaking, I mean, the French section of, oh, Toronto. Toronto, yeah. Right, right, right. You know, yeah t- Toronto speaks Toronto, Chinese now. Chinese, Chinese now, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <not> Chinese. <laughs> and Hindi, right, and so everything else. Do you right. have siblings? Oh, yes. Okay. Well, I ha- I've got one surviving sibling, yeah. Okay, what, what, but where, I, where are you I, ranking? I grew where up you? with, I'm the, I'm the baby, I'm the only boy, of three many? older sisters, and, uh, and, uh, uh, and how many of them are still alive? One, one sister is still alive. Is she actually in order? Is she right next to you? No, she's two up from me. So actually your oldest and the third died, passed away? Yes. Okay. And oh. uh, What so, about your mom and dad? Are they still? Um, no, my, my, my father, there's my father here. Yes. Um, my father um, died when I was seven. My mother, my mother passed away in 2005, but my father, when I was seven, but he was a writer and, and um, uh, he, he wrote, uh, his specialty was, was short fiction, like short stories, and there was a big market for that in the 1950s. Were you really close with your father? Yeah, until the age of seven, but let's see. He died when you were seven? Yeah. And so I am, I am a like laboratory rat that proves that, that uh, nature over nurture, because uh, uh, the only thing that I can do really well in life is I can write. And, and like with the speech writing proves it because I've been put in, in a speech writer for uh, several very demanding people. And like day imagine. in, day out, like, you know, like darts, like, Hit the target, hit the target, right? And right, so, right, uh, right. okay, I'm not, I've never become famous, and 
I'm not wealthy. I haven't I haven't written Lord of the Rings or, or anything like that. But uh, have you? I, I managed. To, I've managed to avoid going to an office for over 25 years, mm -hmm. and I raised raised uh, uh, two daughters uh -huh. uh, uh, on the avails of writing, and I managed to live in a beautiful place in the forest. So th that's because I've been reasonably to your, successful. I've been to your home. I've been yeah. to your home before, <laughs> and I met your wife then. Yeah, your wife then, and that's when I met Gregory Clark. Yes. Right, who's also been on the podcast twice. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. yes. It was his birthday yesterday. I went to go, oh, I, yeah, I sure did. I sent him a birthday card, yeah. yes. Because mm -hmm. I went up there um, to his place and did it at his place. You know where he's right up there in the yeah. hill? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah I, I know, know where he, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm about and, 10 minutes and I believe, south of his. I believe his wife now is from Portugal or? No, Peru. Peru, okay, I, I started with a P. I, I introduced those two. She's the sweetest person. Oh, yeah, yeah. And makes a good soup. Yeah, oh, yeah. Some salad. yeah, she's really nice. So I went to his place and yeah. did it there. It's really nice. Carolina, yes. yeah, Carolina. Yeah. How many years between you and your oldest sister? Uh, Fourteen. My, my that's a lot of space. My father, my father was uh, Canadian. He was born in Toronto, mm -hmm. but in, in the 1930s, he, him and his best friend, he and his best friend went to England. And because they lost their scholarship, they were both preachers' kids, and they uh, were sharing a, an apartment in the university. And they had a fire in the apartment, and uh, the firemen came in and found beer in their apartment. And one of the firemen was a parishioner from uh, High Park United Church. How old, was, and, how old was your father then? I don't know. His early twenties. Oh, it's okay. And, right. and uh, so they lost their scholarship, so they decided to both de decamped England. And my father uh, joined the RAF, Royal Air Force, in 1937. And um, in, the, the, in the beginning of the war, you know, to the Battle of Britain, to have RAF wings on your jacket was about the sexiest thing there was. And he had, my mother said to him, oh, yes, dear. And he had blue eyes, this color of his uniform. Now, your father's from where? In Toronto. No, no, but your father, what? What's his ethnic background? Oh, Scottish. Scottish, and your mother is French. Scottish and French. And no, 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 no. My father is Scottish. My mother is Scottish. Scottish, okay. Yeah, okay, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so you got a double dose. Yeah, right. yeah, right. yeah. Oh, yes. And uh, so, uh, uh, anyway... He was he, an RF. Yeah, and he mm -hmm. just before the war, he, invented, he inherited a little bit of money, and he bought a little Austin Nippy Sports, a sports car. And he wrote, my mother and my grandmother were running this hotel in the Midlands of England near his, the aerodrome where he was stationed. And he roll, the old man rolls up in his little sports car, because pilots could get petrol rations, because they had to be, and uh, so swept the old, the old lady off her feet, uh, the young lady off her feet, and uh, then got her in the family way and was shot down probably after and spent three years in prison camp, a prisoner of war camp in, in Germany, the famous one. You ever see the movie The Great Escape? Yes, yes, well, yes, yes, that yes. Was the, Steve the, McQueen, he was, yes. He, 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 yeah, Steve McQueen, there was no Americans in okay, there. Right, okay, they were okay. all Canadians. Know, Those tunnels were dug by Canadians. And um, so then uh, he got back from, in 1945, weighing 114 pounds, met my sister Elizabeth for the first time. He said, this is your daddy, Elizabeth. She said, my daddy's in Germany, and he's going to stay there. <laughs> they had a difficult relationship. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so they, they moved back to Canada, and uh, my father had written, uh, he, was al he was already a writer before the war, and he wrote extensively about his prison camp experience, and he took it to his agent in New York after the war. And the agent, Jack, his name, he was John Norman Harris, Jack mm -hmm. Harris. Mm -hmm. And the agent said, Jack, everybody's tired of the war. Nobody wants to hear about the war anymore. This is World War II. Yes. And he took and he burned all of his stuff that he'd written about the war. Mm. And uh, it was a huge tragedy. Anyway, um, so during the 50s, he wasn't able to be a writer full time because he had, you know, three, three young daughters and then I came along in 1957. So he was the uh, uh, head of PR for a large bank in Canada and then writing on the weekend and he wrote short stories that were in a lot of different magazines and wrote, wrote a couple of books. 
but uh, the he died of a heart attack in 1963 when I was seven. Do so, you, do you remember the time? Oh yeah, yeah. He taught me to swim the day before he died, and we were in Vermont. At, at was Lake he a smoker? Shepley. Everybody was a smoker. Yeah, he was a smoker. But smoker. but they, we found out we the ex prisoners of war were ripped off by uh, Britain's Ministry of Defense, and we. We had a class action, sort of like a class action mm -hmm. suit against them. And um, we found out that in actuarial terms, you know, uh, uh, ex-POWs died an average of 10 years earlier than the, uh, the average veteran population. So okay. we eventually got some, a small pension out of that. But anyway, so he was gone for my life at age seven. But Did your mother remarry? No, no. And she just raised you on her own. Yes, and uh, 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 well, we we the the bank turned. Although my father had told the chairman of the bank to go himself right. and and quit quit the bank to become a writer full time. Uh, yes, in in nineteen sixty two, he 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 engineered the largest corporate merger in Canadian history. The uh, Canadian Bank of Commerce and the Imperial Bank of Canada became the Canadian Imperial Bank of Commerce, CIBC. And after that was hugely successful and he was kicked upstairs and uh, uh, so he turned around and said, I'd take your job and shove it and cashed in his life insurance in order to fund his writing. We went and lived in, in the south of France. and. Uh, Spain. You left Canada and went to the south of France. Yes, and I went to kindergarten mm -hmm. in French and. But you said, but you, but you said you were seven when your father died. Yeah, well, the kindergarten yeah. started at seven. Well, well, we had come back to Canada, uh, but just before he died. Uh, oh, okay. So this is with your father. You guys actually went to yeah. France, and then you ended up coming back after. Yeah, he passed yeah. sorry. Yeah. Okay, I thought I thought you went yeah. after he died. Okay. Yeah. So. Um, uh, we came back to Canada, but uh, so I had like uh, great experiences with him in li in living in Spain and France. How and long? How long? How many years did you? I, we were we, a year and a half yeah, over there. Like the, 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 yeah. the, uh, I can still remember that very clearly. But what about the language? You didn't speak. Well, I, guess I can speak French. French. Okay, I'm sorry. That's right. So it'd be no problem for you. Well, no, no, mm -hmm. but but uh, I, I that's where it start it started. It started I, there. I, yeah. Okay. Yeah, but. Wow. So w how were you like in elementary school? I mean, what were you like in school? What's, were you more academic or were you more sports minded? No, I definitely, I'm klutzy. I'm totally klutzy, not, sport, not sporty at all. But uh, no, I um, uh, was very precocious in terms of reading and uh, from a very young age. And uh, like in grade three, I had a grade 12 reading level or something. What did you read? What kind of books did you like to read? Well, I was very into reading about the Second World War and mm -hmm. all, all sorts of other st stuff and uh, ships and uh, uh, cars and, and uh, all novels of all sorts. Did that I carry up to, until now? Hmm? Are you still that way? Are those Pretty much, yeah. yeah like, uh, they, they, today, um, I, I spend so much time generating text right. that when I'm finished for the day, I uh, it's like, oh, Netflix, <laughs> maybe Netflix, like, I, no, I don't want to look at any more print, right? Okay. So, right. so you're generating it, you're yeah, tired right. of it, like, you, yeah, you've so absorbed it, you're, you're all, you have, your hard drive's filled up, now you have to get some but, of that out. But that's, yeah. that's why, like, riding the train, like, I live an hour and 20 minutes outside of Tokyo, so I just finished, uh, I read half of, uh, a book by my friend who's a f foreign correspondent based in Rome about his father who was a famous Canadian uh, war correspondent uh, right. about his Vietnam War experiences so on the way in I r managed to read half this book that just just how arrived. big is the book it's not it's not is this, is not, this book no no okay, so oh yes it is it is okay, okay, okay. it is this book yeah, okay. the, the uh, ghosts of war right, okay. which is um, uh, uh, about uh, Bob Reguli, who's a, a very famous war correspondent, and okay. his, his son Eric is a friend of mine. Wow. So, wow. Not a very big book. But, uh, That's good. That's um, good. So, so tell me this. So, so throughout school, you, did you enjoy school? <laughs> <laughs> Go uh, on. Uh, 
some parts of it. Okay. But, what, but, what, what, what were the parts that you enjoyed? Um, uh, well, I've, I still have very good friends from elementary school, but uh, uh, a lot of them. And uh, I, but I was kind of a behavioral problem. <laughs> how was that? How was that? And, like, and uh, I was just, I'm such a smart ass. I have always been a smart ass, mm -hmm. and I'd get into trouble. So I remember it was a grade four. Mm -hmm. I was like, the, at that time, the, the, the education philosophy, the kids were divided up into groups, mm -hmm. and we worked in groups, but I was by myself at a desk. <laughs> I was isolated. And uh, so, uh, um, yeah, I, I mainly enjoyed school, but uh, high school, I found um, not very challenging, um, so I kind of got into trouble in high school quite a bit because I was able to um, uh, just kind of coast through. Right. Did you help other people with their homework or anything? Were you that type no. of kid? Okay, no, <laughs> no not really. So when, you came, so when you came home, you of course you didn't go out and play with your friends or anything like that, did you? Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, I, I, I grew up on this amazing street in tr Toronto and there was an, a thing that came out, an article that came out about living with data, right? So like one, one important decision that your parents can make that affects what happens to you is where they decide to raise you, where you live. Okay. And I grew up on this street, Nanton Avenue in Toronto, Canada, and it was a one block street with 50 about 50 old houses on big old houses and the people that had built them at the turn of the century had grown old and sold them off and they were bought by uh, uh, Second World War veterans in in the early 60s who all had uh, at least four kids, four to seven kids. Right, right, right. And so it was 50 houses and uh, 100 children of elementary school age in a one block street. The, and the cars, baby boomers, the baby boomers. Yeah, we were, we were classic Most baby boomers. Right, right, right. So uh, at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, cars would come to the head of the street, look down and go, no, let's take the next street. <laughs> right? There's so many kids was, on the street. There were hockey Didn't nets. You, know. you played hockey? Well, we all played ball hockey. Okay, like, right, like, right, right, like, right. Everybody plays okay. at least ball okay, hockey. Okay. In, but I'm a lousy skater. so. Yeah. But no, hide and seek, ball hockey, tag, like everything. And at lunch... Uh, you know, in the morning they'd open the door and let the dogs and the kids outside and just r run around and uh, uh, lunch the mothers of a, I've got the nine-year-olds, I've got the 11-year-olds, and they'd phone around and see, see yeah. where, where we yeah. were, but... Um, uh, so you were very, so you were social. I mean, you were not... Oh, yeah, oh, you no. You didn't stay in your room or anything like that. No, 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 no. I, I grew up uh, in, in this tribe, but we're still okay. uh, still very close together. Oh, really? You still have contact with a lot of your friends you grew up with? Oh, yeah, yeah, from, from that street, yeah. Okay. And uh, uh, we have reunions and... Uh, Did any of them stay on the street? Stay over there? No. <laughs> None, of moved away. Moved away. None of us could afford to live where... Cause we're because that, that's, the, that's like um, the uh, poshest there. It's like in Tokyo terms, it's... Denen Chofu, yes, right, right. You. That's it's, what it is now. It, yeah, yeah, well, it, it it sort of was, but it went through a period in the 50s where were all these big houses, the value went down, and you were able to buy it for, you know, fairly... Mind you, our our parents, our fathers at that time, uh, were lawyers and professionals and, and, and whatnot. But uh, now, uh, to buy one of the houses on that street had cost you several million dollars. So it's like none, none of us, all of us uh, moved across the, across the valley to the east end of Toronto uh, okay. or, or further away. Right. And, but you uh, keep up with them, right? You keep yeah, up oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so to college, where'd you go to college? Well, <laughs> okay, here's the, um, I wanted out of high school as soon as I could and uh, so my sister, uh, uh, Laura, was, uh, had been going to university in Newfoundland on the east coast of Canada, and she had been working on the coastal boats, which went to all the little isolated communities all, all the way north to Labrador. And the northernmost communities are, are uh, 
um, Inuit. Uh, yeah. And uh, well, she was doing mainly the south coast of, of Newfoundland, which, which was um, uh, one of the stops along the way is Saint-Pierre and Miquelon, which is a French island owned by France. And so they had to have French speaking personnel on there. So my sister got on as a stewardess because she could speak French. She got me on at age 18 and as uh, soon as straight out of high school, I went on and I got my union card, uh, Siemens union card. And uh, so I was ready for uh, uh, a big adventure. Your Siemens Union card? Yes. Meaning what, you can be on a ship now and that allows you to work on a ship? Yeah. Okay, okay. And right. and I got, uh, you get, I don't know if it's still the same, but we, we got things that were like passports, a Siemens continuous discharge book where they stamp in it that when you, when you join a ship, they stamp in your book. Okay. And then they stamp when you're, you're, you're paid off. Right, okay. And uh, so, um, I started doing that, uh, and then uh, after doing that How for long a did season, you do it? Yeah. that was about six months. Only six months. But uh, going all the way, all the way down to Labrador to to Inuit country, and on the ferries between the two, um, uh, between the mainland and Newfoundland. But no, then I went out to Vancouver, and the same union had a union local in Vancouver. Okay. So I worked on the ships on the. Uh, West Coast to Alaska. What kind of Alaska. ships were these? What kind of ships would well, they do? Well, so the, the passenger purpose? ships. Okay. Well, passengers and freight taking right. okay. uh, taking people and dogs and cases of whiskey to uh, uh, communities that had no roads. I see. And uh, uh, that also worked on tow boats. You know, they're towing log barges right, and right, stuff right. like. That. But um, on my nineteenth birthday, we were in docked in uh, Hyder, Alaska, and uh, which is the southernmost place in Alaska. We actually, Stewart, BC and Hyder, Alaska are right next to each other. And the, the specialty in Hyder is getting hyderized, <laughs> which is uh, like uh, grain alcohol, oh, like pure okay. shots of pure alcohol. And I'd heard about this, I'd heard about this special fare for students of, uh, from American Samoa on Pan Am. Two hundred and sixteen dollars one way from Seattle to Pango Pango, American oh. Samoa. Okay. And on my nineteenth birthday here in the in this bar in Hydra, I said, "Okay, when we get back to Vancouver, that's it. I'm quitting, and I'm going to buy that ticket, and I'm going to fly down to Pango Pango, and I'm going to hitchhike yachts around the Pacific." Okay. And uh, so that's what I did. And but how could you? You're not some more. I mean, it's it for Americans, right? Anyone? No, no. They're like they, they, they say you phone up Pan Am and they say, "Oh, how did you find out about that fare?" It's like, oh, right, right, right. We but can't. Who was, we, who they it, can't who was discriminate. It for them, but who was it for? Um, for American Samoan that's students. That's what I thought you said. Yes, yeah, but yeah. but it's designed for them. But they can't. They can't, they can't discriminate. racially they can't discriminate, discriminate. Uh, with with that ticket. So okay, gotcha. so so I bought I bought the ticket. Flew off to uh, American Samoa, okay. and then hung around, uh, and finally I hitched a ride on a 31-foot trimaran uh, with no engine, no life raft, no radio, and wow. uh, we uh, Western Samoa, and all the way through. Tonga. Did you know how to sail? Did you know how to sail? You learned. You learned. I learned. <laughs> better, better. <laughs> no, I had the Siemens card, man. I mean, like, how did you learn? Oh, right. So they had you doing right. a lot of stuff. I'm yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah, well, there was four of us on, on, on the boat, uh, and um, all the way through t Tonga and Fiji, and it was just me amazing experience. You enjoyed it? Oh, yeah. It was the best, one of the best times of my life. Well, with the beautiful Polynesian girls under uh -huh. the full moon. No, uh -huh. we won't go there. Okay. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah. And, uh, but uh, eventually, um, we got to Suva, Fiji, and the captain's sister sent him uh, uh, an envelope uh, filled with marijuana, figuring like, uh, oh, Fiji, they do good. Anyway, he was arrested and... Uh, Who was arrested? The captain, the captain. The captain, Gary, the captain was arrested. He asked someone to send no, him some marijuana. No, he didn't ask. His dumb sister just like figured... Assumed, oh, okay, he was he, assumed okay. 
And he so, got arrested. Uh, he, so. he got arrested anyway. He, he never, he didn't know it was he coming. He didn't know it was Okay, so what and happened then? So he was, um, uh, they eventually released him, but in the meantime, I, I took um, another, uh, got a ride on another yacht down to New Zealand, and I was waiting for him to get there. And he turned turtle off the North, North Cape of New Zealand, and he spent 22 days. Uh, uh, it's a trimaran will still float when it turns over. Right, right. He that's and called turn turtle? turtle? Turn turtle, yeah. Right, because and, uh, you can't get it back up. Okay. Yeah, you can't get it back up. Right. So, but he, he had the, the dry food and, the, uh, in, and uh, the water and the tools and the, under, the, under the floor. And okay. So he managed to get in there in the bilge and saw a hole so he and he had what looked like a ki uh, kayak. And, and the only there. reason he was saved after 22 days uh, where, were you where were you doing this time? I was in, in New Zealand waiting okay. for him. Okay. <laughs> and uh, um, so luckily, you know, the Charlie the Starkist tuna boats, uh, they had helicopter spotters, these high-tech tuna, and he was spotted by a, uh, a tuna boat. Otherwise, he, he would never would have made it. Anyway, so I was, I was left high and dry. And uh, so I went to the Union in Wellington, New Zealand, for the, the union for the ferries that go between the two islands of, of New Zealand. And they, they um, I said that, I showed them my seaman's passport and said that, uh, you know, I was on the beach, as they say, like without a ship. And he said, oh, I just, uh, I just came back from, from Newfoundland. I met the head of your union. Well, come in and meet the, the secretary of the, the, the head of the union. So I went in and I was telling him about our union which was the, all the guys who were on the convoys in the, in the Atlantic and in, in the war. And uh, they went on strike in 1949 and because they were, they were ripped off by the government. Was, some of them had three ships blown from underneath them. Mm -hmm. These are the old guys that I worked with. Like they were still right, in, the, right. in the 70s. And, and I said, I told this whole story. And the president he sits back smiling. He says, 19, it was an old Scottish guy, Toby Hill, I said, 1949 lad, I was the secretary of the Worfies Union in, in Littleton, which is the port of Christchurch. And I said, I looked after one of those ships for six months. Lad, you're in the union. And uh, so he arranged for me to get my uh, work permit for New Zealand and uh, lent me $100 out of his own pocket uh, to buy uniforms. And the next thing I knew, I was working on the ferries between the two islands in New Zealand. Did that for I don't know, eight months or something. Okay. Then I went to Australia and hitched across Australia, and I got a job as uh, working on a prawn fishing boat in the Gulf of Carpentaria in the north of Australia. And then I quit that and I flew to New Guinea and I got a job as a truck driver in New Guinea, driving up the Highlands Highway. Meepala, so you're, you're maybe twenty by now, or twenty-one. You're twenty. Yeah. Me but I say good play through talk pisin. Blong Papua New Guinea, they speak Pidgin English there. Okay, okay. So I had to learn, I had to learn uh, talk pisin. And you're doing this all solo? Yeah. <laughs> I just like, I just went for it. And uh, so you, then... You didn't have a girlfriend back home or anything like that? Oh, that but the boy had lots of girlfriends. I mean, she had a lot of girlfriends, but I mean, not, along the way, lots of them. Man, was that fun. <laughs> I had hair you down to here. I had hair down to here. I was a beautiful. bad boy. Bad boy. And so, okay, so you went back after that. You went where? To I went to the Philippines, Indians. then Hong Kong, then Thailand, then Burma, then India, and Nepal, and uh, and then went to Germany, where my same sister who who got me on the boats in Newfoundland. Was, is that the oldest sister? No, no, she was the next one to me. The next one to you, okay. Who right. unfortunately was killed in a car crash oh, a few years later. But, yeah. um, um, she, uh, by that time, was uh, teaching at a Canadian NATO base in Germany. So I went, <laughs> went and I worked in uh, the uh, Canadian, at uh, this Canadian NATO base in Germany and then went back to Canada and then got a job uh, on a ship on the Great Lakes <laughs> and then ended up back in Vancouver and decided, well, maybe I should go, I was 23 by this, maybe I should go to university now. So um, I was, uh, having traveled around Asia, I was really interested in Asian history, so I went into uh, Asian history and political science
What college, what college was this? Uh, U, uh, University of British Columbia in okay. Vancouver, right? Okay. UBC. And uh, uh, did you complete the four years? Just about. Okay. And and, uh -huh. and uh, uh, so I, w I wanted to to get an Asian studies major. Um, I had to take a language credit. Sitting there in September in the university cafeteria, I had no interest in Japan. Japan. What a boring country. They're, 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 they all wear suits and ties and do Raijo Taiso on the roof. Like, boring. But you, but you knew about Japan already? No, I mean, not really. I, I, had, I, had, I, had, I, like, I just Japan thought I was interested in Thailand, India, colorful right, right, places. Right, okay, okay, okay. Right? And, right. But I was just sitting there. The, the, but you, really, the, did, you the, really did have a slight, slight disdain for Japan. Well, we'll just not, you just say no, not no, interest, no interest. No interest. No interest. No interest. Okay. So I'm looking at the catalog, the course catalog, I'm going down. Chinese, and at that time it was still communist China. I mean, nah, nah, I don't know who wants to. And then I go down Hindi. No, I was more interested in South India, so I didn't. Well, they don't speak Hindi. Either. And then, then I get down. That's C H. And I get J. Japanese. Ten o'clock on Tuesday. That's not a bad time. <laughs> Because I was driving cab on the weekend. Okay. Oh, really? okay, okay. I was a cab driver on the weekend, and so I didn't want anything heavy on Monday. But it's like, okay, well, Tuesday at 10 o'clock, that'd be boom. F 40, 35 years later, I'm still here because of that idle decision in the university cafeteria going, oh, 10 o'clock on Tuesday. But did you really enjoy the class, or did you start to pick no, up the No, I did, like, the, the, so the, really the, because I'm left-handed, and all the marks were for kanji, and I was like, ta naka sa wa tokyo e ikimashi. Well, test is over. So, uh, but yeah. I signed up for another course, uh, Japanese uh, Asia 105, history of, uh, uh, history of Japan. And had the most marvelous teacher, uh, a guy named John Howes, uh, who came here with MacArthur, learned learned Japanese in U.S. Navy language school from 1942, and came here in 1945, and he was became a specialist in the history of missionaries in Japan. And but his lectures were always they brought uh, Japan to life and the experience of contact between the, the rest of the world and Japan from the black ships onwards. And uh, he, he was my friend from then until his death just a few years ago. And, uh, it really? Yeah, and well, where, he, do you, where do you live? Where did he? He is uh, still in Vancouver, Canada, but he used Vancouver, to come okay. here and uh, and visit with and you. And his son Christian House was a, is a member of Attack. You made him uh, Christian House, great big guy. You know, uh, I'm sure I'd know him if I saw him. Yeah, you would. Is, you would he, know is him. he still a member there now? Uh, well, he, he he will be back. He's temporarily in Canada, but okay. he he will be he will be back. All right, all right. But uh, so you're really close with his father. Yeah, yeah, yeah. His father was your professor. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so the, the the he conned me into it. He made Japan seem like an interesting place. You know, and J J Japan was about to take Japan as number one. Well, yeah, Japanese that might be useful. So uh, myself. So when year did you first come here? I mean, is that well, when you came? after university. Um, I went, we went back to Toronto and I drove limousine in order to make the money to come here. And oh, uh, so you'd planned to come to Japan? It, well, the plan developed. And, okay. And so we yeah, will go for a year, uh, you know, uh, teach some English, okay. make some money, and then go mm -hmm. traveling in the rest of Asia. Mm -hmm. But that was just at the point of Endaka when the, the yen doubled in value and the bubble started. And I got a job as an editor in uh, Kanda Jimbocho, right down the, which is the publishing uh, district of Tokyo. And at that time, it was still uh, Hanshita. Would you get the job really from there in Canada? Hmm? You, you applied for it? No, no, I, I came here. I came here with so wait, nothing. So you, okay, but when, when did you come? How old were you when you came here? 24, 25? Yeah, what is it, 1985? Right, yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, you were about uh, uh, 28, 20, 28 20. or something. Yeah. Okay. And 
Yeah, and uh, so you came here when you with were my years. girlfriend, who is later my wife, and we wait got, the one that I met. That yes, was, that's who you came with. Yes, that you had the two girls behind. Yes, you've only been married once. Yes. Okay. All right. Never again. Never again. <laughs> no, anyway, no. Okay. So we're we're now split up. Oh, I know, I know. But I met her, and I met your two daughters yes. when they were really young, and we had the stinky cheese. Yeah, we loved the stinky <laughs> cheese. And I and I leg wrestled with Greg in your living room. Oh, that's right. I sure did. I remember. That. I sure oh, did. I remember. I sure that. did. I said I didn't know what he was going to do. He said, "Sit down like this," and we entangled legs. Oh, and then he I made me go to the side like that. yeah, I held it. We went like this, and we went to the side. And I didn't know what he was trying to do. But I said <laughs> I wasn't worried about it. But I wanted to see what's he trying to do. And we went like that. And he was tremendously strong. His torso was tremendously strong. Yeah. And we did that. So I was really surprised. <laughs> but I said, okay, I'm done. No, oh, I, no, I, I, just, no I, did it, I did it one more time. I said, one more time, because he, he moved me so quick. <laughs> and I said, okay, let's do it one more time. Because I thought, this older guy's going to beat me. I can't believe this. <laughs> and he took me down the second time. <laughs> yeah. I'd forgot And all your daughters about love that. the sticky cheese. Yeah, and you guys right. had a good time. Well, my, my younger daughter is coming uh, the end of the month. And she is now in medical school. And, uh, you know, the, we, to live out in the, in the forest out in Chiba was, you know, there are no international schools out there. Okay, and, okay. Honey, and so they went to, my two daughters uh, were now 23 and about to be 26. Um, they uh, were homeschooled. In the, in the forest, and my wife did an amazing job at that. Now, your wife is from Canada? Yes. Okay, so she's Canadian. Yes. And she's doing well. She's okay. Yeah, she's, yes. Yeah, yeah, um, so, uh, they were homeschooled half the time, and half the time they went to the local elementary school, Shogako. And was, a lot of people were saying, well, are you sure this homeschooling thing is at a good time, idea? At that time, that's for sure, that's right. But, and so people ask me, is, is it a good, I think, it depends. That's like, right. there, there's some people, there are some people that they're lucky if they manage to escape their crazed parents and have a good teacher and a good educational experience. But if you've got if you're you've got the right sort of parent to do it, and mm -hmm. and uh, it can be really good. Anyway, my older daughter is now at University of Washington, Seattle, doing her PhD in Latin of all things, and um, my younger daughter Nina, who's coming because she has to renew her educan, her permanent residency, and. Okay. Uh, she were people say she must be very smart. I said, Yeah, well, I'm smart too, but I'm lazy. And she's she works like uh, the devil. She uh, the, the, to get into medical school, it, it's unbelievably uh, uh, an unbelievable amount of work. And she just the, the MCAT is called the the medical school medical college acceptance test. And she studied three months, eight hours a day uh, for that. And it was during the, luckily it was during the lockdown, so it was a good time to do it. And Ace. Wait, wait, wait. She, she was here? No, she, she, they were, They're they in went back in, in, okay. to Toronto. Okay. Well, I'm skipping a part, which was the, their homeschooling, their phys ed was ballet, and there's a really good ballet school out there. And, um, all of a sudden, uh, in 2013, my uh, younger daughter Nina was offered a place at Canada's National Ballet School. So all of a sudden, they disappeared, all three of them, my wife and two daughters, okay. and moved to Toronto. Right. And um, distance and one thing and another kind of evaporated but mm -hmm. anyway they began. Um, but your daughter's going to come here and stay with you of course when she comes yeah yeah yes okay, you're still close with your daughter oh yeah and we, we're going I've arranged for her to uh, go and shadow uh, the head of anesthesiology at Kameda Hospital oh that's beautiful yeah so uh, because you've just had an incident if you don't mind talking about it do you yeah no I, I had I'm not going to show had, my scar right but, but you just had open, open heart, heart surgery, surgery yeah yes and that wasn't long ago that was like that was in January yeah in January yeah Wow. Uh, it, it, you know, people said, well, it, it was a very straightforward procedure. It was like there was a benign tumor inside my heart. And it was just, the, the, the cardiologist said, 
usually these are only caught at autopsy, <laughs> right? But they had because I'd had uh, you know atrial fibrillation catheterization of years. Mm -hmm. I went going for regular checkups, and they did an ultrasound, and they found this thing bobbing around. So they had to take the big hocho and uh, whack open my chest and take the thing out. So um, it. Uh, yeah. So how are you? How are you doing right now? Is it oh painful? no, I'm. I'm not, it took it took a couple of months to get back on my right. feet, like exactly. full concentration. But no, I'm. I'm. So back you bed, you were bedridden for a while. No, well, not not that you long. It's just it. it's just like brain fog and no stamina and uh, uh, like sleeping eleven hours a night and stuff like that. Okay. okay. But Kameda is Kameda Hospital in out in on the beach in Chiba. Mm -hmm is one of the best hospitals in Japan. People, people back, back home in Canada was, do, do you feel confident about having this done in, Jap in Japan? They said, the Japanese are very good with knives. Have you, have you ever been to see sushi being cut? Right, tell me about <laughs> so I feel yeah. fully confident. Okay. My uh, cardiac surgeon loved that. Uh, uh, <laughs> I love that, that analogy. That analogy. Yeah. <laughs> so um. yeah, no, that, that went well. But oh, that's good. That's good. Yeah. So you're doing good, and there's no problems, yeah. no complications. No, no, no. Excellent. It's very straightforward. Excellent uh, uh, procedure. So, tell, so tell us. You you brought your book. You told me your book about your father. Yeah. This is the book on your father. What was the book about? Oh, Another this is, this is a, a self-published thing. We we collect all. Oh, you his. did you do that or your father? You know, my sister, my sister. Oh, so he did. didn't write a book. He hasn't written a book. Oh, yeah, he, he wrote other books, but this is a collection. Of, I brought this one because his picture is on the on the back cover here. Okay. Uh, the, but no, he he wrote. Uh, uh, so th this is this is a, a nice picture of him. Right, so right. this is a collection of his. Uh, short stories that he wrote uh, for magazines like Harper's and, and in the 50s there were you know right, right, right. before TV really got going uh, short stories were a big thing and oh, uh, a, a money maker but you no know, one one of the books he wrote was uh, uh, Knights of the Air which was all the top air aces British air aces in World War One were all Canadian like, is that right? yeah uh, and uh, like nine out of ten Okay. And uh, so they were my father's heroes uh, as a young boy in the in the nineteen twenties. Because he was born in nineteen fifteen, so in the twenties, these Canadian areas, and that's what made him want to join the RAF oh, yeah. in uh, in nineteen thirty seven. Mm -hmm. So that was one. And then he wrote uh, a couple of mystery novels, and uh, that did did very well. And uh, so we lived off the avails of his uh, uh, writing. For, oh, really? Yeah, yeah, for the, after he died for a few years. That, oh, that's beautiful. So, uh, what, did, what did your mother do? What kind of work did she do? Um, well, she'd never had a job before. Well, she, she, she was the barmaid at her family's hotel during the war. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, the typical 50s stay-at-home mother. But uh, gradually after my father died, she got her driver's license. She'd never, never learned to drive. And we ended up moving out to uh, a small town where uh, 60 miles west of Toronto, Elora, Ontario, where uh, my father's father's family were from. And in the, moved there in the 1840s. And a beautiful old limestone buildings. And we sold our house in Toronto. and. Bought all these old stone row houses, and on the right on the edge of a river, and restored all these uh, houses. And she opened an antique shop and tea shop, and and uh, so she was. My house now in Chiba is filled with antiques that I in inherited from her. I bought a whole container full of uh, her treasures over, and uh, so. You moved from the house that I visited, right? Yeah, that was mm -hmm. I was renting that from Greg. From Greg, right? We we, we bought yeah. a place in Onjuku, okay. which is fifteen minutes Mr. south of where where you visited, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and uh, I've got a, a one acre forest property, completely private, oh, that's and uh, uh, so uh, now it's me and my three cats, 
and wild boar, the Enoshishi, they're digging That's up right. behind my house last but isn't night. That, isn't that some good eating? If you can. Yeah, yeah, we, oh, yeah, oh, we, we, I've I mean, got friends who are hunters, and yeah. I can get, but you can want, you want Enoshishi meat? I get it for free, but because they, they can't sell it. Is that right? No. Oh, can't. because it's not properly, yes. Yeah, so, um, but, yeah. Uh, yeah. I, no, I'm okay. <laughs> you want it, like, great on the barbecue, great on the barbecue. No. My son just got food poisoning or something. He just had some deer meat. Well, you got to freeze it first. But I don't think I don't think he got it from the um, deer meat. I think he had um, norovirus. Oh yeah, and that could be from somebody's nasty hands. It yeah, yeah. Take a whole lot. Well, well, you, and you, because it happened too quick, there. I understand that if you do deer meat, it, you can't get sick that quick because it takes a while. Yeah, if you get it because of the the meat. The but norovirus. It's almost yeah, like yeah. That. And that's what he had. But no, and from both ends, it comes out oh, of both yeah, ends. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But what, what you want to do with any any wild meat is uh, freeze it first, okay? Right, because that kills all the all the parasites. Okay. So the, you you don't eat it fresh. It's right. got to be for. And did you ever meet C W Nickel? Mm, I may have. It's the bearded bearded guy. I may have. The the night the, 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 the fourth. Yeah. And he had o- right. in the Japan Times he had old Nick's notebook. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, okay. And I don't think I met him. Yeah. He started he started his own kind of uh, national park, this forest reserve in Nagano. Okay. And he became a really good friend of mine. He's my guru. He lo- we lost him three years ago. Oh, did you? Sadly, oh. uh, uh, but uh, I took him to the Canadian Arctic. Mm-hmm. As I've got a client who, um, uh, clients and dear friends, this family who run, uh, they don't, we don't call it cruises, we expedition voyages on a 300 pa- passenger ship uh, going to Greenland and the Canadian Arctic, like through the Northwest Passage. Mm-hmm. And uh, Nick, as C.W. Nickel was known to his friends, um, <clears throat> his early years. From, he was born in Wales, but at age 17, he was uh, he was sent as advance man. I wasn't even a man. I was only a boy, advance boy, uh, to uh, uh, Kujuak, Quebec, uh, the north, on uh, the very north tip of Quebec, and uh, for the advance man on a birding expedition, a bird research expedition, okay. and um, so he ended up spending most of the next 10 years. In, in the Canadian Arctic and uh, with all sorts of adventures. I shot a polar bear wait, once. Wait, wait, wait. Right. From the time you took him? No, no, no. This is when he was young. Oh, but, when he was young. Okay, he okay. was from age 17, okay, right? Okay. And uh, so okay. I needed to, I was organizing this uh, voyage and we were having a t- crew from TBS come along. And, like uh, I was in charge of promoting the thing and um, so I needed somebody like that. Like I didn't have the budget. Like sense. like see, normally oh. you'd, you'd get, take a couple of million yen. Right now, I finally found his email address, and I said, "I don't know if you're interested. I don't have the budget. It's a small family-run company, but if you want to come, we're starting in Kujuak, Quebec. We're going to Cape Dorset, Pangnertung, uh, Greenland, all these places." Half an hour later, the phone rings. Hi, it's Nick Nickel. I want to go. I don't care about the money. Is it, oh, wow. My adventure started at age 17 in Kujua, Quebec, right, which is then Fort Chimo. And, and, and so, like, the chance to go back there, I'm in, right? So, so he's Canadian as well. Well, he, he was Welsh, he was born in Britain, became a Canadian citizen, and then became a Japanese citizen. Wow. And, uh, How many years did he live in Japan? Do you know? I don't know. Over like 30? 30, over 30 say, yeah. years. Right. And, like, the emperor and empress went to visit him up in, in Naga. And Prince Charles went to visit him. He was, the, he was the most amazing character I met in, in this country. And um, he, he loved to drink. And he was, he was the pitch man for Nika whiskey. And he'd come to my house and we'd get the local hunters. Because he was a, like uh, one of his, his big causes was get, we got to eat the meat from the forest. And so we'd have a big Inoshishi barbecue and drink way too much whiskey and uh, uh, so yeah oh my goodness god bless so Nick telling. yes <laughs> how long, so how long have you been here now in Japan um, uh, well remember Gilligan's Island yes yeah, I remember. 
on a three-hour right, tour. Right, right, right. right. <laughs> I'm here for endless reruns on Gilligan's okay, Island. Okay. Uh, so I came in 1985, yeah, right. and then we left in 1993 when the bubble was over and went back to Toronto for seven years. And then I came back in 2000 or 2001, um, um, and I got a gig uh, for working for Ford and Mazda um, when Ford controlled Mazda. And I wrote for Mark Fields, the CEO of, uh, of um, Mazda, who went on to become the CEO of Ford, and mm -hmm. and, lay, and then after that, Lewis Booth, who was the second, who was later the Ford C C CFO, and that was what uh, when Nissan heard about me, they they kind of poached me from oh, from there. So uh, so I've I've been I've been the president of two automakers. Oh, that's right. Because <laughs> nice. they, they don't, the people the. the FAQ number one was, how much do they tell you about what you, I said like, the like, an stock answer that's less than you might think, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? Uh, like Gone, uh, you know, Gone has a heavy French accent. Uh, uh, his standard brief was, send me something, I will tell you if it's wrong, right? <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, which means like golf in the fog, it's like, okay. I know there's a hole out there somewhere, <laughs> right? It's, it's like, right? And like, it's got to be at least close to close the green. To the point, right. Okay, that's a respectable drive, right? Okay. Like, if, yeah. if it's way off in the rough, it's like, yeah. he would rip, yeah. he never ripped up one of my speeches. He never, he and this, this is my idiot savant talent. Like I said, I'm not good at anything else, but I'm good at doing this. You told me how you do it too. You said you get up and you go for a walk by yourself. Yeah, yeah. And that's when the ideas start to come. Yeah, well, I, I always say, the, the, I tell clients the best way to use me it's like, um, you don't say, please say this, this, and this nicely. You say, we know there's a squirrel up in those trees over there. Find the squirrel and shoot it, right? And so um, that's, that's kind of the way I, I work best. Mm -hmm. And like with, with these CEOs, like with Gone, the Nissan PR people, like here, didn't, like I'd be doing uh, oh, your assignment is Tony Blair and Mr. Ghosn in Nissan Sunderland plant in England. And the Japanese staff wouldn't be able to tell me anything about, like, well, what's the situation? And, Hold on a second. What, what situation, what uh, constituency does Tony Blair represent? And I look it up. It's right next to the plant. And nobody bothers to tell me this. So this sp speech... Him and Mr. and Tony Blair on the stage, and there's all the assembled workers at the plant. There's, so Mr. Blair, you know these people. You have knocked on their doors through three elections, right? That that's the that becomes the opening, and uh, I once did him and Putin in opening the St. Petersburg plant, and mm -hmm. like, <laughs> like stuff would come over the fence. It's like, uh, oh, what do you do? But I've I've worked on it. These my specialty has been uh, guiding CEOs mm -hmm, here, mm -hmm. and uh, I've worked on some amazing turnarounds. And uh, Mazda, which the, 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 what Ford did, n never got enough credit. And actually, Mazda saved Ford. Uh, all of Ford's manufacturing was completely revamped according to what they learned. This, uh, for both Renault and and Ford. It was like capturing an intact Japanese battleship. They got to see, like, wow, that's how it all works. So they could. Employ, and right. and uh, that's right. But the other turnaround I worked on recently was McDonald's Japan. Uh, with her, you were with, with Sarah Casanova. Sarah Casanova. She's she's here, one right? of my favorite yeah. people. She's also from the same part of Ontario that I'm from. Oh, is that right? And, and her uh, husband loves Harley Davidson. Yes, exactly. Ernie. Yes, yeah, yes. yeah. So no, the, the, the she got. She got promoted to chairperson. Uh, I, I wrote for her for three years, but now the um, the Japanese new CEO does all the speaking. So, but we're still friends. Uh, oh, that's beautiful. And so, uh, that's good. no, but the, like 
what Sarah did, the turnaround of, of McDonald's she Japan. She did a fantastic yeah. job. Oh, oh yeah. I'm telling you. I have to see her. I haven't seen her since. I only met her, I think, once or twice at the American Club. Uh -huh. And I was really impressed with her because uh -huh. I told her about motorcycles. She said, oh, my husband loves hey. Harley Davidson's and we ride all the time. And I told her about my triumph, that I have the biggest commercially made motorcycle <laughs> in the world. <laughs> 2,300 cc's of pure power. <laughs> That's right. No, yeah. anyway, so tell me, what does the future hold for John Harris here in Japan? <laughs> oh, oh. Was that the almost future? like, a, was that like, like from a speech writer? Almost? You know, <laughs> God, this pandemic, God knows. Like, what, what will become of me? Like, uh, <laughs> um, I don't know. I live alone in the forest, and uh, I continue to write, uh, and I can continue to live... Um, as long as people pay me to write, <laughs> but uh, uh, after that, I don't know. Um, okay, do you plan on you? You don't know if you'll be here. Or do you think you'll ever leave? Well, I've got such a beautiful place, and and uh, I couldn't afford anything back in Canada now. Like mm -hmm. the, the the land prices are cheap here, and and uh, you mean to try to duplicate what you have here? Yeah, I see. right. I'd, I'd be in a basement suite if I went back to Toronto. Yeah, um, so uh, I don't know. Uh, well, the way I usually end the podcast, John, I ask this question. What do you consider a good life in Japan to be? A good life in Japan, I would consider, well, it's, it, for me, I love Japanese nature. Like, pe people come here and they think it's all... Tokyo, it's all concrete and, and urban, but out in the forest, uh, I'm completely surrounded by the forest, and I don't play music a lot. I, I, you know, have the windows open and it's quiet, and I'm completely attuned to the forest around me, and my calendar now is the natural calendar that uh, we're just finishing rice planting now, in my neighborhood, and, but the spring starts with the uguisu, the Japanese bush warbler that has this wonderful fruity long solos that they go into. But every year, and this happened for years, I've, I've only noticed this when Facebook threw up one of those memories when, when I said that, um, oh, the first uguisu sang this morning on March 5th in the morning. So the, uh, it was March 5th that threw up this memory. And I, oh, and I go outside. There it is again, exactly at the same moment. What happens from now, at the bottom of my hill, there's a little river and uh, uh, it's uh, famous for its fireflies, for its hotaru. And the fireflies are coming out. And then after the fireflies come the hydrangeas, the ajisai and then comes to you rainy season which i don't like so much but uh but uh just this cycle of nature uh for me and connecting with nature in japan that for me is a good life but also being able to it's a rainy day i'm tired of being out here in the forest i can come in to tokyo an hour and 20 minutes by train in from the uh from the pacific surf beaches and as I did today, to sure. enjoy this wonderful morning with you, uh, yeah. Lance. Thank you very much. I want to thank you so much, John, for being <laughs> a part of this. I want to thank all of you for watching this podcast. And remember, it's all on loan, so continue to reach for the stars because you're too blessed to be stressed. <laughs> yeah.